Hi, AP government. This is AP government. This is the first video I'm making. I might make one. This is what I covered on Monday, the 22nd. That was a rainy day. Uh, let me do a quick review like I did in class. I did a quick review. Um, and, and you could use the review, too, because you haven't heard this stuff since Friday. So no whining, okay? Uh, you'll need about oh, at least 10 note cards today. Be ready to take some notes and show them to me. And, okay, so remember one thing I taught you on Friday was that the uh, many ideas from the Enlightenment did find its way into the Declaration of Independence. The Enlightenment was a time period back in the late 1600s, the mid 1700s, where they sat around and drank a lot of coffee and they, they had a lot of political ideas. So with the scientific revolution, they, they used rationality for science, but in the Enlightenment, it was political, okay? So they in the Enlightenment, they challenged the views of the relationship between people and their government, okay? Um, now, it's not that important that you know who John Locke is, but you do need to understand natural rights, rights that are, are given to us at birth by nature. We are born with them. John Locke said life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson will change that later to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And I don't think Locke came up with this. I think um, someone else did, uh, Rousseau. Government is based on the consent of the governed. I think that was Rousseau. Okay. It's not that. Um, this is not a history class. This is a government class. But understand consent means permission. Permission of the people. Popular sovereignty. You need to know that word, popular sovereignty. Montesquieu, separation of powers, separate the government into three branches of government, legislative, executive, judicial. Okay. You need to know what that means. I talk, talked about that on Friday. Okay. And then Rousseau, he talked about this social contract, this invisible contract between the people and the government. And, and if that contract is broken, and the government becomes a tyrannical turd, then people might overthrow that government. That's where this comes in. At. That's Rousseau's idea, not John Locke. Okay, we wrote that down on Friday. What's important, though, is you recognize popular sovereignty, people power, separation of powers, Montesquieu, natural rights. And these ideas did find themselves in the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so we wrote this down, limited government. It's government that is limited. What limits it? The Constitution. So the, basically the government is limited. It can't just do whatever it wants to. It is limited by the law. And the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And I probably should have capitalized that uh, because it's the name of a document. Okay, write that down. Republicanism, write this down. We are not a direct democracy. We don't just vote for every single issue. We vote for people to represent us. Republican representatives has nothing to do with the Republican Party. Uh, Repub we are a republic. The United States is a republic. We vote for representatives to make decisions for us. Okay. All right, so one thing that we started doing on Friday is that sometimes I'm going to give you a multiple choice question. Take your time. If you're watching this at home, do it on Edpuzzle. I'll, it'll pause on its own, and then you need to answer it. Okay, the answer is B. Okay, that is not. Remember, not. The other four are Enlightenment ideas, but B is not. That's a trick. Anytime there's a not question, it's tricky. Okay, so Declaration of Independence. We talked about it last time. I'm going to talk about it again. 
it listed the reasons from the break from England. It does not create a government, but it does talk about some of the philosophies. Okay, it does say that all men are created equal, but it doesn't really matter what it says because this is not the Constitution. Okay, so here it is. I think that's all of it, honestly. It, uh, I could be wrong, but I think that's all of it. It might have cut some things out. But check this out. Um, so when in course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. So it's breaking up with England. You know, the declaration is like a breakup letter. Okay. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Think about who said that. That was from the Enlightenment. That was John Locke. Okay, that was John Locke from the Enlightenment. If you're absent on Friday, that'll be a problem. Okay, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. That is John Locke's natural rights. Okay. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's Rousseau's idea. That came from consent means permission, people's permission, people power. That's popular sovereignty. And if the government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. That also comes from Rousseau. The people can overthrow the government if it becomes tyrannical. Okay? So, according to College Board, this is what you need to know. These are the ideals that were in the Declaration from the Enlightenment. Social contract, Rousseau. Natural rights, John Locke. Consent of the governed, John Locke. Government exists to serve the people, popular sovereignty. That's Rousseau. That's what you need to know about the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration is a required document for this class. And that is what you need to know right there. Okay. So the Declaration proclaimed natural rights and democratic ideals. All right, so we talked a lot about on Friday the Articles of Confederation. You should have a note card on the Articles of Confederation. So what was the problem with the Articles of Confederation? Obviously, there was a problem, okay? Um, it was too weak. It had no executive power to do anything, no power to tax, no power to draft soldiers. It was just a weak piece of junk. Okay, it gave too much power to the states. That's what sovereign means. It means all powerful. But it was made that way on purpose because the people of America were afraid of a tyrannical government. So they made the national government weak and the state governments strong. Okay, um, they had a military, but they couldn't draft soldiers and they couldn't pay for the military because under the articles, there was no power to tax. Okay. And finally, it um, finally um, it took a unanimous vote. You need to write that down on your if you were absent on Friday, it was a unanimous vote. Now we wrote this down on Friday, Shay's rebellion. Um, this was a rebellion that happened during the articles. It was a bunch of farmers that couldn't pay their debts or their taxes. They had a rebellion. Lots of people were hurt and died. And the national government was like, we can't do anything. We can't raise an army. We can't, you know, we just can't do anything. And that this event really showed people that we need a stronger national government. And that's when they all got together to write the constitution. It was after Shays rebellion. Okay. We wrote that down on Friday, but I'm trying to help a few of you. All right. Check this question out. All right, go ahead and answer it. I don't want to read it for you. The answer is E. Okay. All right. So 
delegates came around to this constitutional convention to scrap the articles and write the constitution. James Madison was the father of the constitution. He was the smartest guy in the room. He was the one that was the most conscientious. He was the smart one. Okay. Compromises were necessary. So let's review. What were some of the compromises that were made? We talked about this on Friday. What were some of the compromises made? We didn't write all of them down, but we wrote some of them down. Okay. First of all, um, the, Virgin the Virginians came along and said, we should let the big states have the most power. Makes sense. But then you have tyranny of the majority. Okay. Then the New Jersey, New Jersey plan came along and said all states should be equal. Okay. Which makes sense too. So the great compromise, the Connecticut compromise said this, Congress will have be bicameral, two houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives, two chambers. And in the Senate, all states are equal in the Senate. Every state has two. Then in the House, the big states have the power. So really the Senate is like the New Jersey plan and the House is like the Virginia plan. And it was the Connecticut compromise. Connecticut was a medium sized state that made this compromise. And that's how we get Congress. There are 435 members of Congress and I think there are 38 members in the House from Texas. Okay. Now, what about that other compromise about slaves? It's called the three-fifths compromise. For every five slaves, it counts as three toward population. That was a compromise because the North didn't want to count them at all. Okay. And the South wanted all of them counted. But they weren't citizens. So it didn't seem right. All right. So this is a summary. We didn't write this down, but it's a good summary. Another compromise would be about regarding slavery. The importation of slaves from Africa will be outlawed in 20 years in 1809. That was a compromise. Now, slavery wasn't outlawed, but the importation of slaves would be outlawed 20 years from 1789 when the Constitution was ratified. That means legally approved. Okay. All right. Check this out. The answer is A, bicameral, two houses, two chambers. Okay. Now, there are limits to democracy. We are not a direct democracy. We don't just vote for every single thing. Um, the founders feared mob rule, and you could kind of see why. You know, Shays' Rebellion is an example of that. Constitution does not use the word democracy, but it does refer to us as a republic, republican form of government. Okay. We did not write that down. All right. We did write these down. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and go to the next slides because I'll put them on separate slides, okay? So make a note card on participatory democracy. People participate, all right? Uh, people vote, people protest. We went over that on Friday, okay? And um, other ways of participatory democracy, elections, primaries, town hall meetings, initiatives and referendums. A primary is is an election to narrow down the candidates. If you're the Republican Party, you don't want to put up six Republicans to go up against one Democrat. That won't work. Democrats do the same thing. Each party has primaries to narrow down the choices. If you want to make a note card, what is a primary? It's an, it's an election to narrow down the choices so you only have one candidate. Initiatives and referendums are, are built laws that come from the people. I'm still a little confused on that. Okay. Pluralist democracy. 
in this country, we have interest groups that all fight for influence. And these are just four examples. You have the NAACP fights for civil rights. You've got LULAC, the NRA. You've got MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Other interest groups would be labor unions. Um, pro-industrial groups, pro-environmental groups, pro-choice, pro-life groups. Those And so pluralism is this idea that these interest groups compete with each other for influence. That's pluralism. So participatory is about people participating. Pluralism is about people donating to interest groups and fighting for these interest groups. Then you've got elite democracy. Elite democracy is when, uh, and there's different versions of it, but these representatives who happen to be richer than we are, more educated than we are, they do things in the government without asking us. They make decisions. Like, I don't, rem we didn't vote to give Ukraine $70 billion in aid. Um, most of these guys did because they have foreign policy experts and military experts and stuff that made these decisions for us. Okay. Um, think about um, how, um, yeah, anytime the government makes a decision without consulting the people, that would be elite democracy. Okay. All right. Check this out. Okay. One class didn't see this question. This is not an easy question. I rolled it down to two. I got it right, but I wasn't very sure. All right. Take your time on this. But the answer is D. Tough question. I knew it was B or D. But remember, gridlock is when both parties are fighting against each other and nothing gets done. And gridlock is not what pluralism is about. Pluralism is about, is about interest groups competing with each other. So D is a better answer than B. But B does look good, but it's, B is not the answer. All right, now check this out. This is a good example of a question that I didn't have you write it down, and now I'm throwing a question at you. So if you're struggling with it, it's because you didn't write it down and it's my fault for not telling you to write it down. So good luck on it. The answer is A. Okay. Definitely not B or C. It's the opposite of B or C. Okay. All right. Um, other limits to democracy. For a long time, the Senate was not elected by people. They were chosen by your state legislatures, like the ones down in Austin. They chose who the senators are. And here's something. I didn't have anyone write this down, but an independent judiciary. Once federal judges get their job, that's it. You can't get rid of them. I mean, maybe you could, but it's really hard. Okay. The judiciary needs to feel like they can make their own decisions without reprisal from the public. Okay. So I know it's scary, but they are in there for life. That's all federal judges, not just the Supreme court. And here's something crazy and we'll talk more about it later, but the president is not elected by popular vote. The president is chosen by something called the electoral college. We'll talk more about it later, but check this out. Hillary Clinton in, in 2016 beat Donald Trump by 3 million votes, but she did not win the presidency because of the where the votes were. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Okay, make a note card on what our Federalists, these guys supported a strong constitution. They were led by Alexander Hamilton. Okay, hit pause if you need to, but I'm moving on because I think we wrote this down on, on Friday. And then anti-federalists, they feared this new constitution. They feared tyranny. 
They wanted strong state power, not a strong national government. Think of these as like farmers who were just like, if you government people come on my yard, I'm going to shoot you. Just think of it that way. Okay. Okay, write this down. Okay, so I'm going to play a video for you that's five minutes, and I might pause it. Um, Federalist 10 is one of the required documents of this course. It was written by Madison, and and I'm going to let Steve Heimler teach it to you. Okay. Video, we're continuing to look at the foundational documents for AP government, and that means it's time to talk about Federalist number 10. So if you're ready to get them brain cows, milk, violence, and faction style, well, then let's get to it. So since this is our first document from the Federalist Papers, let me give you a quick introduction to what this series of essays was. During the ratification debates over the new Constitution, John J. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, who represented the Federalists, who were very much in favor of the new Constitution, published essays in the New York newspaper in order to convince the public to ratify. In doing so, they addressed the most common objections to this new form of government and gave a sense of how the nation would work under this new Constitution. Okay, so Federalist 10 is James Madison's attempt to answer the following question. How will the new Constitution protect the liberty of citizens against the tyranny of the majority? Now remember, the framers of the Constitution were emphatically not fans of pure democracy, and in this case, it's because in a pure democracy, the majority will always win out over the minority, and thus there is no protection for minority views. And by the way, when I say minority here, I'm not talking about ethnic minorities, but rather a smaller number of citizens like the opposite of majority. So, Matt so Madison was afraid of a tyranny of majority. Imagine if 50% plus one vote ruled the entire country. That would be a tyranny of the majority. That's what Madison was afraid of. Madison comes out of the gate talking about the dangers of factions, and that is a key word you need to associate with Federalist 10. He says, among the numerous advantages promised by a well-constructed and none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of factions. So factions are such a threat to liberty that Madison uses the word violence to describe their actions. Now, what does Madison mean by the word faction? Well, he goes on to define it. By a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. In other words, a faction is a group of citizens whose desire is to dominate government so that they might impose their own interests on the whole society. And to Madison, as well as to the Anti-Federalists, this is a great danger. Now, the Anti-Federalists would not agree with Madison's solution, and we'll see that in the video on Brutus 1. But for now... Okay, so factions, think of poor people as a faction. What if poor people took over the government? I mean, it sounds like it'd be pretty cool, but the point is, is that um, poor people make up the majority of this country, but... The government is designed to not let a tyranny of majority happen for good or bad. Yes, majority rule, but not always. A majority of people in this country want marijuana legalized, but it's only happened in certain places. So Madison Federalist 10 was a paper that feared factions and tyranny of the majority. Now, what is Madison's solution to the violence of faction? Well, he proposes two possible solutions. There are two methods of curing the mischiefs of faction. The one by removing its causes and the other by controlling its effects. So, the two options available are, one, stop the factions from ever forming, and two, let them try to form and then limit their power. He says that if we're going with number one to remove the causes of factions, that is a terrible option. Why? Because that will necessarily destroy liberty. It could never be more truly said than of the first remedy that it was worse than the disease. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire, an ailment without which it instantly expires. But it could not be less folly to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life because it nourishes faction, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air, which is essential to animal life because it imparts to fire its destructive agency. To destroy liberty in service of controlling factions is worse than having factions in the first place. The other way to remove the causes of factions is to make sure that every citizen has the same opinions on everything. But as anyone who's been alive for more than five minutes knows, that is not possible. Madison, tell us why. As long as the reason of man continues fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions 
will be formed. Okay, so removing the causes of faction won't work, so Madison suggests that the only protection against their tyranny is to control their effects. And the best way to do that is through a Republican-style government as opposed to a pure democracy. A republic, by which I mean a government in which the scheme of representation takes place, opens a different prospect and promises the cure for which we are seeking. Okay, so how does a Republican-style government laid out in the Constitution solve the problem of faction? Well, it mainly has to do with the size and diversity of the nation. Madison says that as the nation grows in population, you take in a greater variety of parties and interests. You make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens. Or if such a common motive exists, it will be more difficult for all who feel it to discover their own strength and to act in unison with each other. And so, the so that's a tough read. Now you know why we don't read that in class. Um, never mind. The result of that is play. The influence of factious leaders may kindle a flame within their particular states, but will be unable to spread a general conflagration to the other states. Now, in case you didn't catch it, Madison's solution to the danger of factions is this. As more people are added to the nation, more and more factions will necessarily form, and that has two consequences. First, with so many factions, their power will be diluted so that no one faction can always get their way. And second, because they're all in competition with one another, they will be forced to compromise their interests in order to pass legislation that considers the common good of society and not merely the interests of one group. Okay. Well so that's it for this video. What what this guy said is that there you can't get rid of factions because to do so you'd get rid of liberty but with all these factions competing with each other then that will help lessen the negative effects of factions so liberty causes factions so you can't get rid of liberty but you can help lessen their negative effects by letting all the factions work against each other so that's what madison was saying he also said that having a separation of powers will also lessen the problems of faction. It makes the gov so if like one dominant faction takes over, they still would have trouble getting anything done because of separation of powers. Okay, that's it. That's Federalist 10. That's what you need to know about it. And I don't have any multiple choice for you yet, but that's what we'll review on that later on Wednesday or next time. Okay. So I think that's um, that's the same thing, really. Okay. By the way, this seems kind of out of nowhere, but um, we have a lot of different governments. You got the federal government, the U.S. government. Then you have 50 state governments. Then you got a whole bunch of local governments, county, city, townships, even school districts. Okay. Or our governments, really. Okay. Now, write this down. Um, Brutus one, Brutus one is a required document for this class. It, and, um, it was written, it was written by anti-federalists. This is kind of an answer to Federalist 10. It said the United States is too big to be a Republic. They said somehow that in history, the only successful Republics have always been small, like small towns or something like that. I don't know if that's true. But that's what anti-federalists said. Now, here's something that we are going to talk about in this class. There is a clause in the Constitution that says necessary and proper clause. And there is a clause in there that says that the government can do whatever it needs to that is necessary and proper to carry out uh, any of the other duties that was given to them. Okay, we'll write that down some other time. But... You got to admit, that does sound kind of scary. Who decides if it's necessary and proper? The courts. That's what the courts are there for. Okay. Um, and certainly they thought that the government would just get stronger and stronger and stronger. And maybe that's right. I don't know. But, uh, and it did get stronger. But we're here so far. <laughs> so far. Okay. Um, Make a note card on this. I don't know how important this is yet, but I will know soon. Uh, the Federalist 51, the Constitution will divide the power, meaning between power between the states and the national government. 
or divide it among separate branches, Montesquieu's separate branches. And that, that will lessen tyranny. Okay. Yes, yeah, separation of powers is basically what Federalist 51 is about. I would, and you can easily summarize that. You don't need to write all of this down, but do write it down. Okay. Um, and the legislative branch, which tends to be the most powerful, that's also divided into two branches, two bicameral legislation, the House and the Senate. Okay. So you can see the Federalists in their Federalist papers were trying to convince people, people of New York, by the way, but that this Constitution is going to be okay because of separation of powers and federalism. Thing. I mean, in the division of the national and the state powers. Okay. All right, real quick. Um, who were the Federalists? They tend to be a little bit more rich. They tend to be a little bit more elitist and more intelligent and more educated. The anti-federalists were the poor, the common people, and they believed in more participatory democracy, more popular sovereignty, less elite democracy. And the federalists wanted a strong national government. The anti-federalists wanted more state power. Okay. All right. Here's a question that I had some trouble with, but go ahead and do this. Okay. All right, the answer is, I believe it's B, okay? Um, now, it's definitely not A, all right? Because, you know, Brutus did not want a strong national government. Br the document Brutus is anti-federalist, okay? Now, C does look good, but... But Madison never said that power should be concentrated in the executive branch. He never said that. Okay. He said that the factions would kind of even each other out. He didn't say that we should have a strong executive branch. And, he's, and it's not D because the effects of factions can be controlled by letting the factions uh, compete with each other. So that leaves with answer B. Okay. Not an easy question, but it is B. Okay. All right. So here's some important stuff. Um, in addition to the Bill of Rights, there were some personal protections that are granted in the Constitution to ease the fears of the anti-federalist. Uh, these are all going to be in the second next sl few slides. Uh, I want you to write these down. First of all, I didn't have you write this last one down. There are no religious qualifications for public office, even though nobody will admit to being an atheist. That is true. You don't have to prove that you're a Christian or something. Okay. All right. Write this down. It simply means that if you're going to arrest somebody, you got to produce evidence. Habeas corpus simply means produce the body. Corpus means the body. Think corpse. Produce, um, um, produce the body, produce evidence, write this down. Okay. Um, write this down. Ex post facto law. Imagine if they made a law and then they put you in jail for breaking it before it was even a law. Post means after facto fact, after the fact law. Look at the cartoon, write this down. Okay. All right. Now, write this down, how to propose in a constitutional amendment. There's more than one way to do it, but this is the most common. you got to have two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives, two-thirds. And then it's sent to the states. Three out of four states needs to vote for it and for it to be ratified. Now, you need to know the word ratification. If you need to write this down on a separate note card, go ahead. Ratification is when you sign it, date it, stamp it, and then it becomes law. All right, write this down. All right. And finally, um, I want you to write this down. 
and we will talk about it in the next lesson. And then um, we ended um, the most current lesson. I want you to, I'm going to move, I'm going to change slides now. I want you to put this on a note card. Um, I'll t or if you want to wait till class, I'll, I'll tell you which ones. Uh, the most important ones, declare war, maintain an army, regulate interstate foreign trade. Um, the top three are important, foreign policy, that's a good one. Those are the ones I told everyone to write down. Shared, that means the national and the states share the power. Maintain law and order, taxes, uh, borrow money. The states can do that and the national government can do that. States, there are some things they do. They deal with schools, local governments, regulate businesses within the state, marriage laws. Um, that's what the states do. Okay. All right. That's enough for today and for this lesson. Thank you.